I'm so thankful that you're worshiping with us this day. And if you're joining us online on BoxCast or YouTube, we are honored that you're worshiping with us. As our call to worship, hear these words from the Apostle Peter, 1 Peter 1, beginning with verse 3. He writes, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. Bow with me, please, for a word of prayer. God, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for this time that we can gather, we can sing praises to your name, we can contemplate this morning what the Apostle Paul has told us is most important. And so guard our hearts and our minds, help us to cast aside any burden or anxiety we brought with us, and help us to focus on Jesus. He's the author and the perfecter of our faith. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen.
And friends, I'm so thankful that you're worshiping with us today. Will you turn around and greet one another for a moment? Greet.
Amen. Friends, will you pray with me before you sit down, please? God, we thank you for this day. And we thank you most of all for Jesus, your son, who died on the cross, was buried in the tomb. And on the third day, that tomb couldn't hold him. That grave couldn't hold him. He was raised to life. And because Jesus lives, we also can live if Jesus is our Savior and our Lord. And on this morning, we look at the gospel. What is the gospel? Help us to revel in this good news, the hope of Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. A couple things to let you know as we get into the message today. Tonight at 6.30 p.m., Stephanie and her team are going to be under the tent at the Danville Rescue Mission as part of their ongoing revival. And I'm going to be bringing the word. And I want to invite you to come on out. Uh, you might want to grab a sweatshirt or put on a fleece or something, but it's at 6.30 p.m. tonight at the Danville Rescue Mission. Second thing I want to let you know, several of you have said to me this morning how thankful you are that I'm not in Lebanon right now with what's unfolding in our world today. Um, Israel is at war, and we don't know where this is going to go. I received a message late last night from my good friend Tom Adama who is the leader of Heart for Lebanon, the ministry that Dean Crandall and I work with. And this is the message that he sent. I thought it was important enough. I wanted you to hear it. He said, by now you've heard the news out of Israel that war has broke out. He said, with Lebanon being so fragile right now, we, we are praying that Lebanon does not get pulled into this. He says, there are numerous Palestinian camps in Lebanon, and Hezbollah definitely has its footprint and he said, please ask your people to pray that peace will emerge and that this conflict doesn't escalate. But then what he said next is what I really want you to hear. He said, it's a reminder that as Christians, we must be about our father's business now. The days are short when no man will be able to work. And so I'm going to pray again. I've been praying a lot this morning. That's a good thing probably. So I'm going to pray again, and I want to ask you to continue to pray. So pray with me, please. God, we thank you, and we come to you right now. We just pray over this entire situation in the Middle East. We especially pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ in Israel and in Lebanon and in the Middle East. I pray for the ministry, Heart for Lebanon. Um, I pray most of all that the Prince of Peace, Jesus, your son, would allow hearts to soften and, and war to stop and that more and more people would come to a saving relationship with Jesus, your son. And it's in this word and this name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Well, friends, how many of you have heard of Gordon Food Services? Gordon Food Services is huge. A lot of teachers are smiling as they raise their hand. I want to start today with the story of Paul Gordon. Paul Gordon led Gordon Food Services out of Grand Rapids, Michigan for many years, and he was considered like the boss of all bosses. People loved working for this man. I didn't know him, but I've read a lot about him. And 15 years ago, right before Easter Sunday in 2008, he received just a devastating diagnosis that he had cancer and it was aggressive and his days were short. And so following Easter Sunday, he just felt so compelled. Um, he knew his time was short. He decided to write a letter to all of his employees. And in the letter, he thanked them for their hard work, for their good work, especially for the support they'd shown him and his family during this difficult season. But I love how he concluded this letter. Listen to these words. He says, while the outlook for my time here on earth is not long, please rest assured that my outlook for eternity is secure. He said, I don't say that because of anything that I've achieved from an earthly perspective. The only reason I can speak so confidently is because of God's grace. The Bible says that we all fall short of God's standards. I am only made right with God because the penalty that belongs to me was paid by Jesus. That is what the celebration this last Sunday, Easter, was all about. Jesus conquered sin and death and the grave when he rose from the dead. It is my desire and my prayer that each of you would come to experience that grace and have the same assurance of where you will spend eternity. And three weeks later, less than four weeks later, 
He went to be with Jesus. And those are powerful last words, are they not? And my guess is many an employee of Gordon Food Services contemplated where would they spend all of eternity. And so that's where I want to begin today. And I, I, I don't know the, the breakdown of people that are here. I don't know the breakdown of the people that are on the live stream. My guess is many of us are Christ followers. I'm guessing many of us, we've made that decision. We've declared, I believe, that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Son of the living God. But this message that I'm going to share with you today is probably the most important sermon I will preach this year. It's definitely something we need to be reminded of. Just a reminder, we're in this group sermon series. This is week five uh, with Catlin Church of Christ and Crossroads Christian Church here in Danville and Pine Village Christian Church over in Indiana. First three weeks, we looked at John 17, that really long final prayer by Jesus about unity, how important unity is. And then last week, we started uh, five different messages we're calling Unity in the Essentials. And last week, we looked at the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119, and why God's word, it's a non-negotiable of the faith. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And today we're going to look at one of the longest chapters in the New Testament. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In fact, if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Christian writer J.B. Phillips says that it's the most important chapter in the entire Bible. Think about that for just a moment. And it's 58 verses long, but we're only going to look at four of those verses primarily today so you can relax. Um, it's important, though, that we understand why Paul wrote the words that he wrote. So let's talk about 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians was a letter that Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth. Corinth was a corrupt city. It was evil as evil could be, and yet the church in Corinth was trying to do the right thing, and there was a lot of challenges as the Christians of Corinth were being catechized by culture more than Christianity was changing the city. And so I describe 1 Corinthians, the book of 1 Corinthians, kind of like this. It's kind of like a spiritual spanking. Some of us grew up in a home when we were wrong. What did dad do? He kind of gave us that spanking. I think the book of 1 Corinthians is kind of a spiritual spanking. And you could go through that later and you see Paul's addressing a lot of issues that need to be addressed. But then he comes to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's called the resurrection chapter. And he ends this letter on a high note. What he is saying is the most important aspects of the faith. So with that, let's dive in. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's read the first four verses. Hear this word of the Lord. Paul says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received... I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised to life on the third day according to the Scriptures. And right here, Paul begins by sharing what is of first importance, what is most important. And so four reminders in four verses of Scripture that we can't miss as a church that we can't miss as Christ followers. And number one is this, we are saved when we embrace and accept the gospel and nothing else. We are not saved by our good works or our exemplary character, although you should be a good person and you should have good character. We're not saved by our devotion to God's word, although I hope you will develop that rhythm of daily devotion. We're not saved by our generosity or our acts of service, but I remind you, your tithes and offerings are crucially important, and serving in ministry is very important. We're not saved by religious ritual or by family heritage. Verses 1 and 2 say we are saved by the gospel, the good news. What's gospel mean? Well, it literally means the good news of what God has done in Jesus Christ. The Greek word that it comes from literally means good news. And in the New Testament, the gospel refers to the announcement that Jesus has brought the reign of God into our world through his life and death and resurrection 
from the dead. And Paul says, you are saved by the gospel. You're saved by the good news. When you believe in Jesus, when you accept Jesus as Savior and Lord, and when you understand that culminated in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Crucially important message. Here, here's number two. The gospel is this. Christ died for our sins. Christ died for our sins. We call this the theology of the atonement, the theology of the atonement. And we've sang it all morning long. Every song that we have sang articulates the theology of the atonement. See, this answers the conundrum of the Old Testament system for sin. If you had time and you just started journeying through the Old Testament, it'd take you a while, 39 books, but you would see that sin is a constant plague on God's people that want to be holy and want to be righteous, but they commit sins. And blood must be shed to cover those sins. But they never really go away. And then Jesus is born in Bethlehem on that starry night 2,000 years ago. And everything changed. And it culminated when Jesus Christ died for our sins. The book of Hebrews says that Jesus became the one time for all time sacrifice for our sins. Now, that's not just something that we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In fact, I'm going to give you several other New Testament citations where this theology of the atonement, this theology that Christ died for our sins is shared repeatedly. Galatians 1.4, the first book that Paul write, wrote, he says, Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. And then Romans 4.25, maybe Paul's masterpiece, the book of Romans, he, Jesus, was delivered over to death for our sins. And then Colossians 2, we studied this in the Oasis Bible study not long ago, that God forgave us all our sins and he took it away, nailing it to the cross. And then Peter, our guy Peter, we started with Peter today. 1 Peter 2.24, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, the cross, so that we might die to sins and live in righteousness. And then a chapter later, 1 Peter 3.18, Christ died for our sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. And then my favorite teaching of all, I'm going to talk about it tonight at the rescue mission, at the revival, 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Paul says this is the gospel that Christ died for our sins. And if you're a Christ follower, that's really good news. That means you don't have to be perfect. That means that you don't have to try to worry about living a perfect life. Uh, the battle has already been won. Here's the third truth. Number three, the gospel is this. Christ was buried in the tomb. Now, I've heard a lot of sermons and lessons on this, and most of the time, the preachers and the teachers, they start with the gospel, but then they really spend all their time talking about Christ died on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures, and then they jump over here to on the third day he was raised to life, and they forget what's in between. What's in between? That Christ was buried in the tomb. Paul includes that as part of what's most important. Why is that there? Wasn't everybody buried in a tomb? Not in the first century world. Not when you were crucified. Who was normally crucified in the first century world? Criminals, right? Bad people that did bad things. And many of the times, those families, man, they disowned that person. They were all alone. And so they, they die by crucifixion, and the Roman soldiers, they peel that body off the cross, and they just go dump it in the garbage heap. In Jerusalem, that garbage heap was called Gehenna. And, and that's not very nice, is it? But that's what happened. And so let's play this out. Let's say that happens with Jesus. Jesus dies on the cross. It's Friday afternoon. They take his body down, and they just dump him into the garbage heap in Gehenna. And then Sunday morning, he comes walking out of the garbage heap, and he's pulling a banana peel off, and he's, you know, dusting off garbage. And he says, hey, I'm alive, I'm alive. What might people say? He never really died, right? He was just temporarily stunned. His injuries didn't overwhelm him to the point of death. But we have what I'm calling resurrection heroes 
heroes of the faith that disclosed exactly how Christ was buried. So there is no doubt whatsoever that he was truly dead and truly raised to life. If you have your Bibles and you want to flip over to John chapter 19. John chapter 19 is one of the post crucifixion accounts. We have post-crucifixion accounts in all four of the Gospels, but John 19 is interesting because it tells us about how the burial took place. And these two heroes, I call them resurrection heroes, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus the Pharisee. And so let me read for you verses 8, 38 to 42. Here's what it says in John 19, after the death of Jesus on the cross. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. That happens in John chapter 3, and that's the context for the most famous Bible verse of all, John 3.16. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. My friends, that is a lot of myrrh, and that is a lot of aloes. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen, and this was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. And what we're reading, whether you realize it or not, is that if Jesus wasn't really dead when they took his body off the cross, he would certainly be dead after that took place. No way is he going to be able to survive being wrapped in 75 pounds of myrrh and aloe. What the Gospel of John is telling us is there's no doubt whatsoever. When they sealed that tomb on Friday night, Jesus, his body was lifeless. He was dead. No doubt about it. And I think that's why Paul includes this when he tells us what the gospel is. Christ died for our sins. Absolutely. He was raised to life on the third day. Absolutely. But do not miss, he was buried in the tomb. Here comes the good stuff. Number four this morning, the gospel is this. Christ rose from the dead on the third day. The crucifixion, obviously, is central to the gospel message. Jesus Christ died for our sins. Um, I look forward to Good Friday worship services. Um, it's not joyful. It's somber. But it's an important part of our Christian journey. Christ died for our sins. But what sets Jesus apart from all other religions and all other religious leaders is this. Jesus Christ overcame the grave and he was raised to life on the third day. I could say it a dozen different ways. The tomb couldn't hold him. The ladies showed up on that first day of the week expecting to be in mourning and the tomb was empty and before long it was the greatest celebration of all. That's why for Christians, the biggest day of the year, it's not the 4th of July, even if we love our country. It's not Halloween. Of course not. Even if you like to decorate, it's not Thanksgiving. It's not even Good Friday. What is it? It's Resurrection Sunday. It's Easter Sunday because Christ rose from the tomb. And in our text, I'm not going to read it for time's sake, but in verses 5 through 8, what follows this, Paul says, in case you all are doubting me, that Jesus was raised from the dead, he appeared to Peter, he appeared to the 12, he appeared to 500 brothers, then he appeared to James, then he appeared to all of the apostles, and he said, if that's not enough, guess what? He appeared to me, myself, Paul. Now, that appearance took place later, obviously, Acts 9, on the road to Damascus. But Paul is writing that, I believe, so people will go check it out. If they're saying, you know, dead people don't raise the life, Paul's saying, go talk to Peter. Go talk to James. Go track down some of the 500. Go, go track down people that saw him. One of the questions that's asked, and you probably know this, but there are some within Christianity that wear that label Christian that say, give me the parables, give me the cross, but 
the resurrection didn't happen. Dead people don't raise the life. And Paul addresses that also here in 1 Corinthians 15, and he ponders the question, what if there's no resurrection? And here's what he writes. He says, if there's no resurrection, then that means that not even Christ has been raised. And he says, that means our preaching and teaching is useless. He says, that means our faith is useless. He said, that means that we are actually false witnesses. We're liars. He says, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, our faith is futile. He's saying, if there's no resurrection, there's no hope. And I'll just say this for me. If there's no resurrection, man, I'm out. I'll pick up golf and start playing golf on Sunday mornings or something. Um, that's how crucial this is. But if Jesus really did raise from the dead, arise from the dead on that Sunday morning, everything changes and that's good news. Because Jesus lives, we can have that hope that'll never perish, spoil, or fade. It's kept in heaven for you. Because Jesus lives, we can face tomorrow, even when today stinks, even when we don't understand what's happening. Because Jesus lives, this life, man, it is not the end for Christ followers. It's the promise that the very best is yet to come. Yes. Paul says that's the gospel. He says that is good, good news. I am going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to read the end. Paul's made this case for 49 verses for the resurrection. And you should read all of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But I love how he ends this, this lesson. I love how he ends this teaching. Here's what he writes beginning in verse 50. He says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. He says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the imperishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory in Jesus because he died on the cross according to the Scriptures, and he was buried in the tomb. And on the third day, he was raised to life according to the Scriptures. I don't know if I should or not, but I have personal heroes of the faith people that I've looked up to, that I've learned a lot from, some of them I've never met. One of those heroes of the faith is the late Dr. Tim Keller. Some of you have Dr. Keller's books. He died of pancreatic cancer earlier this year, went through a four-year battle with cancer. But one of the things about um, Dr. Keller that I love, Tim Keller, he's just very transparent about all that he went through. And Russell Moore, who is the editor of Christianity Today, sat down with Tim Keller. Um, I think it happened this year, but I love Tim Keller's words, and I want to share them with you. Check out the screen right now. Well, okay, uh, let me just say something that Kathy and I have talked to each other about in the last year. If Jesus Christ was actually raised from the dead, if he really got up, walked out, was seen by hundreds of people, talked to them. If he was raised from the dead, then you know what? Everything's going to be all right. Mm. Whatever you're worried about right now, whatever you're afraid of, everything is actually going to be okay. Mm. Uh, because, because you got to remember, we're not just talking about resurrected people. Jesus Christ is, and this is where Christianity is unique, we're talking about a resurrected world, meaning other uh, there's plenty of other religions that talk about a future afterlife, which is a non-material world. In other words, you get a consolation for the world we've lost. Mm -hmm. 
Christianity says it's not just your bodies are being resurrected, but the, the world is actually going to be a material world that's cleansed from all evil and suffering and, uh, and sin. And if Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, then the whole world is going to be, in a sense, resurrected. Mm. And everything is going to be okay. Mm. Everything. You don't, even, you don't know how, I don't know how, but it will be. So, uh, and you know what? Actually, it would, right now, I couldn't possibly be convinced that Jesus was not raised from the mm. dead, either intellectually or existentially. So whenever I'm, and by the way, but Kathy and I, listen, we cry, we, had, we, we cried a lot last mm. night. Sometimes the reality of the shortness of what we have left here just overwhelms us, and we were just weeping together and, and crying. And then you say, if Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, it is going to be okay. And then you can wipe your tears, but you don't stop mm. crying. Uh, it's like salt in the wound that keeps the wound from going bad. Mm. Uh, that keeps the wound from getting infected. But it doesn't mean that until the end of, you know, until we actually meet Jesus Christ, we're, we still have our wounds. So they aren't going to be mm. healed. But they'll be healed by his. Did you hear it? If Jesus was really raised from the dead, if he really got up, then everything is going to be all right. And I got to tell you, I needed those words this week. Many of us have needed those words this year. It's been a hard year for Second Church of Christ. We've endured some tough and some unexpected deaths as a church this year. We've watched and even are, are watching as families lost loved ones to cancer and other awful diseases. In the Oasis Bible study, it seems like our prayer list just keeps getting bigger and bigger. My family this week endured uh, just painful, painful loss watching some of our very closest ministry friends lose a child, 22 months old. They'll have to bury this precious little girl next week. Spent time this week at the Pendleton house with John and Judy. John passed away from pancreatic cancer yesterday morning. And as I was with Judy very early in the morning, spending time with her, she said something that is so very profound. She said, I don't know how people do this without Jesus. It's good, good news. If Jesus was really raised from the dead, if he really got up, everything's going to be okay. So real quickly, my, my timer is not my friend this morning, but turn to John chapter 11 real fast. I want to tell you this story. John 11, Jesus is doing ministry, and, and he gets the word that his really good friend Lazarus is sick and near death. And Jesus doesn't come right away. He keeps doing ministry. He's Jesus. Do whatever he wants to. And it says, by the time he gets to Bethany, Lazarus has been in the grave for four days already. And so Martha, Lazar Lazarus' brother, meets him. And if you have your Bible open to verse 21, you can tell she's an unhappy sister. And, and, and she grabs Jesus and says, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. She had no idea Jesus is getting ready to do a miracle. She had no idea he's getting ready to raise Lazarus from the dead. But Jesus shares with her some of the most profound words he ever shared. And here they are. He said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me will live even if he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he looks at her and he says, do you believe this? And Martha said, yes, I believe. And for 2,000 years, women and men have been answering that question saying, yes, I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. He's the son of the living God. He's the son of the living God. Jesus is alive. And friends, because he lives, Christ followers also will live. This is such good news. And so my bottom line for you, don't miss this. Christ followers have victory in Jesus, not because we're awesome, not because of anything that we've done, but because of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus lives, we also will live. And so it's the time and the service for me to pray and for us to sing. But before I pray, if you're here today, if you're watching online today, and you've never made that decision to follow after Jesus, you've never declared those words, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. 
He's the son of the living God. Don't wait another day. I'm going to be right over there for the rest of the service. And I would love to share with you the greatest news of all time, that Jesus died on the cross and he was buried in the tomb. And on the third day, he was raised to life. And that's the gospel. And it saves us as good news. Pray with me, please. God, thanks for this day. Thanks for the chance to be in this word, this good word, this most important word. And, and God, for those of us that have never trusted in Christ and Christ alone, bur burn our hearts. Ma make us uncomfortable. Speak to us through, through maybe a song we're going to sing or a scripture that we're going to hear. God, I just pray that men and women will have courage to make the decision that they need to make. And God, for those of us that are Christ followers, I think our call is simple. We can't keep this news to ourselves. We can't just be happy for 60 minutes a Sunday. Help us to be your ambassadors. Help us to tell the story of Jesus. Help us to let other know, others know what's of first importance, what's most important. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Your love has rescued me. Your love has rescued me. Oh, yes, your love has rescued me. Amen. Amen. Friends, will you take out the elements that we use? When we do communion every week here at Second Church. And if you're online, whatever, whatever you're using, bread, juice, whatever it may be. I want to stay in 1 Corinthians and jump back to chapter 11. The Corinthians were even messing up communion. They even couldn't get communion right. And uh, Paul had a word for them. But I want to just give you part of what he wrote to them. Here's what he said. I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So what I want you to do right now is I just, can I encourage you to bow your head, to contemplate, to meditate what we've studied this morning, what we've sang about this morning, that Christ died for our sins. Maybe say it like this, Christ died for my sins. God made him who became uh, who, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him I might become the righteousness of God. And when you're ready, receive the bread, symbolizes the broken body, and drink the juice, it symbolizes the blood of Jesus. Let's contemplate. Our Holy Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. He's the one time for all time sacrifice for our sins. So we get to become the righteousness of you, whatever that means. We're so thankful for your amazing grace. And so we proclaim the death of Jesus this morning. Thanks for Jesus. It's in his name that I pray. Well, friends, I want to thank you so much for worshiping with us today. A couple things to let you know that are happening, really just two announcements. One is three weeks from today is a big day in the life of our church. It's Fall Fest Part 3. And uh, last year, we think we had like 800 people come out for the Fall Fest. It's a great front door for our church. And I hope that you will come from 4 to 6 p.m. Some of it's going to be outside. Some of it's going to be inside. One thing everybody can do, though, is we need candy. We want to saturate the young'uns with candy. So we've got these big barrels. The parents are saying thank you right now, by the way. But we've got these big barrels. So if you're uh, able to grab a package of candy, drop it in, that would be greatly appreciated. Here's the second thing. For the 18th straight year, we are doing a food drive as a church. And uh, beginning next Sunday, we invite you to take a box. And then the last two Sundays in October and the first two Sundays in November, bring those boxes 
back full of food. We're not keeping any of it. We're giving all of it away to great food pantries that are serving pantries like St. James and Antioch that are doing just a great job. And so um, it, it's been a blessing to be able to serve the food pantries by doing this food collection. One thing, if you're here Wednesday night, and you can stick around after Oasis or after the Connect Groups. We're going to be putting all these boxes together so we can give them away. And then the last thing, um, several weeks ago we rolled out, we're not calling it a bulletin. It's not a bulletin, but it looks like a bulletin. So we're rolling this out, and it's an information sheet is what it is. And it, it's available every week. It lets you know how much the offering was, how many people were here, and important announcements that are happening in the life of the church. They're scattered throughout the building. Make sure you get your copy so you can be informed. And uh, with that, I'm going to ask you to stand up. And for our benediction, our doxology, I'm staying in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Here's how this incredible resurrection chapter ends. Hear this word. Paul says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Man, let's be Christ's ambassadors this week. Let's be the salt of the earth. Let's be the light of the world. Let's tell the story of Jesus, and let's do it with grace and love, and you are dismissed. Have a great day.